In this talk, I contrast the medical model approach and the individual psychology approach to signs, symptoms, and presenting problems. There is an accompanying handout on the course page that has some additional information as well as the references for this talk. You will be learning several aspects of the individual psychology approach in this course. The individual psychology approach to this topic is markedly different from the medical model. In the medical model, signs are observable phenomena, things you can see or hear or possibly smell when you're with your client. Signs can be identified by anyone, but your training and expertise are essential in understanding their significance. Symptoms, on the other hand, are the subjective experience reported to you by your client. You cannot see, hear, or smell them. Only the person who is having the symptom can describe it. The presenting problems are the reasons your client is seeking treatment. Some could be signs, like a tremor, or distractibility, or a twitch, while other presenting problems could be symptoms, like feeling depressed, or anxious, or low energy. Signs, symptoms, and presenting problems are explored using the FIDI model, frequency, intensity, duration, and impact. Signs and symptoms are the focus of DSM-5, and a DSM-5 diagnosis can point you to an empirically supported treatment for that diagnosis. Individual psychology looks at signs, symptoms, and presenting problems in a different way. We consider all behavior, including signs, symptoms, and presenting problems, as movement, and all movement as a striving for perfection, a movement towards a fictional final goal. Some people develop lines of movement that function as safeguards or excuses, protecting them from an anticipated failure or a blow to their self-esteem. Shulman and Mozak propose eight common safeguarding strategies. Safety, Hugh or Martyr Saint, Attention Service Love, Power, Revenge, Face Saving, Excitement, and Proof. We go on further and assert that this perceived threat or anticipated failure is related to the demands that life places on us, to what Adler calls the tasks of life. Adler proposed three tasks of life, communal life, work, and love. Communal life includes our friendships and relationship with the community at large. This includes a sense of connectedness and solidarity with the whole human race. The work task entails the choice of an occupation and satisfaction with the job. Love includes the development and maintenance of intimacy as well as the gender guiding lines. Drikers and Mozak proposed two additional life tasks, although there are some individual psychology practitioners who disagree. Powers and Griffith devote a considerable amount of time in their first interview to an exploration of the three life tasks. The reason we devote so much time to an exploration of the life tasks is because they are often related to the development of a neurosis through what is known as the exogenous factor. The inability to solve one or more of these tasks or the sudden appearance of an aspect of a task that the person feels incapable of meeting is often associated with the onset of symptoms. As we are exploring a person's development, we are listening for instances of inadequate preparation for the task or tasks that they are confronted with at the time of the onset of the symptoms. 
In their semi-structured interview, Powers and Griffith focus on the current life situation, the presenting problem, and the life tasks, what they call the general diagnosis. The purpose here is not simply the collection of information about the client. While collecting this information, the individual psychology practitioner is listening for lines of movement and the purposes or goal that is directing that movement. We are especially focused on the life situation of the client when symptoms first arise and when symptoms emerge or intensify over their lifespan. This is why I like to collect a developmental timeline for each of the three life tasks. This is an expansion of the life task portion of the Powers and Griffith interview. Usually, I start with a timeline of life stressors and changes, such as moves, job changes, marriages, divorces, etc., writing down the events across the page. Next, I focus on the work task, inquiring about who worked in their family of origin, then their first job, and then their work history, using the stressors timeline to coordinate time. I follow a similar process for the love task and then for the community task. I end up with four lines, stressors, work, love, and community. I conclude by asking the client when on the timeline the presenting problem first started and when in the past there were similar symptom outbreaks. Another powerful tool for understanding symptoms in individual psychology way is what has come to be known as the question. It is item 29 in the first part of the Powers and Griffith interview. The answer to this question often reveals the life task or challenge that the symptom is being used to avoid or safeguard from and can be used to hypothesize the purpose of the symptom. I encourage you to write it down as close to verbatim as possible when you are doing your interviews. Here are three answers to the question that I got from clients who had been referred to me for treatment of insomnia. Can you guess which one ended up in marital counseling? <laughs> 